Welcome to the Inside Texas Football, powered by InsideTexas.com. I almost said it, gentlemen. I was cautioned by our capable producer not to say it, and I almost did it. Amazing how the human mind works. Hey, I am your host today, Paul Wadlington, joined by the ever-capable Drew Kelson and Ian Boyd. Justin Wells can't join us today. That's bad news for you because we're going to miss out on his wit and charm. It's good news for you in that I speak English as a first language. I'm not from East Texas. So it's pros and cons. And we're going to be talking about some pros and cons later today on our main subject, which I think you'll find edifying and enlightening and interesting. But before that, I need all of you to like and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. And of course, uh, we all write and contribute at Inside Texas in addition to doing these vids and podcasts. Uh, make sure you come join. And if you haven't done it yet, you want to dip your toe in the water, I think you'll enjoy it if you have. Uh, if you have the ability to do so, I think you'll enjoy the conversation there. Good combination and balance of a lot of fun, but also a lot of information and real analysis. So without any further ado, I want to welcome our two crack analysts, Drew Kelson and Ian Boyd. And I want to talk about the pros and cons of being an HC and a play caller. HC, of course head coach. So this is a subject probably near and dear to Texas Longhorn Hearts because we have just such a head coach. Uh, he's an esteemed play caller and he's growing, I think, into the role as a head coach. Obviously, Texas just completed a, a playoff run. Uh, and we're kind of looking to the future of what this program is going to look like. And we want to talk broadly, not only about Texas, but also other programs where we have other head coaches and play caller situations on both offense and defense. So Ian Boyd, I throw it to you, sir. You just muted yourself. This is a form of silent protest by Ian based on the length of my introduction. Ian, I want to throw it to you. What are some of the pros of your head coach also being your play caller or your offensive or defensive coordinator? Well, I think um, this probably matters more in the NFL, but it's hard to get an elite play caller and, and designer of offense um, without making him your head coach. Like a guy like that is always going to be a meteor, not, not just because scoring points is conducive to winning games, but it really excites fan bases. It really excites donors and uh, owners. And uh, you just, and it excites recruits. Just your whole program has a better vibe around it. If you have an exciting offensive design and an exciting offensive mind. And if you want that, probably going to need to make him the head coach, which as we'll get into has a lot of problems at the college level that aren't quite as bad at the NFL level uh, because the head coach has so many duties in college football beyond designing game plans and uh, managing staff, which is already a lot. Right. Um, I think it also gives the program a little bit of potential stability I think we've seen programs that are actually instable because the head coach is so caught up in play calling and offensive design that he's not able to oversee something else that's essential like recruiting or staff management or, you know, the players not forming a criminal enterprise under your nose or something like that. Um, but uh, it theoretically should give the program stability because you're not dependent on a particular hire who's going to be poached away, right? If your genius play caller is your offensive coordinator and not the head coach, then he's not long for the program, right? Because someone else is going to hire him. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Drew, are there any other pros to the, the, the wondrous head coach play caller, whether it's defense or offense? Drew, this is a guessing game, because if you don't say what it is, then Paul's going to get to it in about a minute. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I mean – for example, I mean, I think for us, and maybe because I experienced this with with with, with Mac Brown, right? Um, Mac was neither the play caller or the defensive coordinator. And as time went on, as we had OC transition out or DCs transition out, you're rebranding yourself. I mean, you're you're bringing in another defense. You're bringing in another OC. You don't know if you have the players in place to to fulfill that offensive scheme. If it's completely different, if you want to shift schemes, um, I mean, Tom Herman had I mean, 
a dozen receivers on the roster and, and didn't have enough meat on the roster. So um, from, from that standpoint, I just think schematically it can be trying uh, because you're, you're redefining yourself. Uh, and so when you do have a philosophy or someone who owns at least one side of a philosophy, let's say it's offense in, in the case of Texas, uh, that does provide some stability there. You kind of know that that's going to anchor the program. And in our case, you know, offense sales. Um, you want to be able to score points and having an OC, having a head coach who is the figurehead of the program, but also can provide that stability because he'll be in the program. I, th I think that's beneficial. So it's it's hard for me to see it a different way, um, even though we've probably seen Saban do a great job of, of managing that over the years. But he's great and he had a ton of resources to help do it. Yeah, you know, sometimes when you look to the very elite in a profession, you want to draw the broad lessons from what made them successful and not the specific things that made them amazing. Because it's very difficult to imitate specificity, right? Mm -hmm. Who they are, right? You want to try to draw the broader lessons. And, and to your point, Drew, interestingly, Mac Brown did have one bedrock of stability that he took from North Carolina with him in Greg Davis. Mm -hmm. And that partnership, that marriage didn't end until Mac Brown actually tried to impose an offense on Greg Davis that he didn't want to run fundamentally because Mac Brown's lesson from playing Alabama in 2009 was not that Colt McCoy got injured, which is what decided the game. Uh, his lesson was, Oh, power football. We got to run it between the tackles. And Greg Davis didn't want to do that. And I think you saw that marriage break up over that, but Davis had been that stability and bedrock. Right. And also no criticism of Mr. Davis, and I know he had been a head coach. He was not seen as a young up-and-comer, hot commodity. We got to go get this guy as our head coach candidate. So he did sort of provide that coordinator level stability. The flux was on the defensive side of the ball. To your point, Drew, Gene Chizik, very different approach from Manny Diaz. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Chizik kind of meat and potatoes guy. Uh, Manny Diaz, hey, we're going to stunt. We're going to delay. We're going to do all these you know, things. And, uh, you know, we saw Greg Robinson, of course, brought in back to meat and potatoes. It's all these sort of steer over steers, right? It's what we do with our college girlfriends. <laughs> I didn't like that crazy wild girl, even though she was fun. I'm going to go to this nice girl. Oh, the nice girl is kind of boring. Uh, we, we head coaches can do that. And I guess one way you, you can create that bedrock of stability is if you own one side of the ball. So at least one side of the ball is always stable. One side, that's where you might have the flux. So that brings us to what are the pros, or I should say, what are the cons? Well, actually, we just talked about the cons, didn't we? What, what are the actual huge advantages, if any, that we haven't explored yet of, of this situation? Ian, what do you think? Well, a lot of Texas's offensive staff is theoretically pretty fungible. Um, I think losing Kyle Flood would probably hurt some, but they could get by and everyone else is, could be, I mean, they've, they've rotated wide receiver and running back coaches since Sark got here. Um, AJ Milwee, I, I think Sark is pretty attached to him and I think he has a lot of strengths, but he's not like a, you know, like he's replaceable. I think not to put people on blast. They, it, it's not that hard, I think, for Sark to maintain what he has right now. Now, it might be hard for him to improve upon it. You kind of wonder because he's so hands on and so involved with the offense. Like maybe it'd be hard to get an exciting young quarterback coach or an exciting uh, co tight ends coach or something who, who would have to come in and just do things Sark's way. But theoretically, there should be a lot of stability there. Um, there's also, as we'll get into, you have a really good pitch at Texas to a enterprising defensive coach hire at coordinator. You kind of need a really good defensive coordinator. I mean, you definitely do. Cause Sark is not that involved on the defense. Like every once in a while, we'll hear him chime in and be like, you know, I, I, I really want us to play tighter coverage. And then like maybe a few games later, they start playing a little tighter coverage. Right. And it's like, a, it's like a delay. And it's obviously, he's obviously not like super hands on there. Um, but the, 
So they need someone that can manage that side of the ball, but it's also a good pitch. Cause if you, if you tell a defensive coordinator, like you're going to have a lot of latitude here and you're going to get a lot of the credit. If you want to go use that in job applications later on um, when you leave to become a head coach somewhere else. So not particularly stable there. Cause you're probably going to have a turnstile, a defensive coordinator like Mac did, but the, the pitch should be good. If, if you're capable of making good hires. I, I do agree theoretically on the the disadvantages of having a turnstile on the defensive side of the ball. But I will say maybe there is an advantage being at Texas, having the resources, but also just an advantage from the environment of NIL. If a coach, if you're a great DC or a solid DC that has a scheme that has shown a little bit of being able, because Sark believes even in his own offense, he believes in flexing from year to year. He doesn't bring the same exact offense into every season. He's always looking back to reflect, tweak. He'll even tweak his personnel if there are some things he sees that he can address. That same approach, has, they take the same approach defensively, or at least he asks for that same approach defensively. But I do think with the environment we do have today, unless a guy really wants to be a head coach, let's say Jeff Choate wanted to be a head coach, there's people who want that track you can find a good defensive coordinator who just wants to own a side of the ball, be great and establish himself at a program like Texas. Um, I, I just, I feel strongly about that. There are people who literally, they just want to coach ball. They want to be a defensive coordinator and move on from there. Um, not everyone who's an offensive coordinator. I, I do feel like on the offensive side of things, you do find a different personality who wants to have full control and be a head coach. Uh, but I just, in general, I do think this environment today may put you in a position to keep a coach that just wants to be paid well, work hard, and stay somewhere and build his reputation throughout that. So uh, that is one thing from a turnstile perspective that hopefully can work in our favor. But one person you didn't mention that I think is critical and not fungible, uh, Jeff Banks. And, and not, I mean, yes, he's a tight end coach, but why is he the tight end coach? Well, he's a special teams Guru. I mean, we've seen our special teams perform incredibly well and consistently over the last three years. Um, he's a relentless recruiter and he's involved in recruiters far beyond his room um, in, in several cases. And so there are pieces beyond the schematics that I think need to go into consideration. Um, and, and a lot of it does have to do with recruiting and development. Um, so, yes, schematically, uh, there are impacts when you have those transitions from coach and OC and DC, and those can be dramatic. Uh, but you do have to take in consideration some of the recruiting advantages that come along um, uh, with having certain people on the staff as anchors, even though they're not schematically involved or schematic influencers. And Jeff Banks is probably one of those more so, uh, more so than not. So, gentlemen, I want to introduce a paradoxical thing to contemplate and see if we can reconcile it here live on air. The head coach as play caller, whether on defense or offense, has been successful. We can point to several examples, right? Steve Sarkeesian, Lincoln Riley. Uh, last year may not be the best example for Lincoln, but he did have a prior track history. Uh, Ryan Day, who now is transitioning to an offensive coordinator. What we've seen is a lot of success with these folks but they always eventually transition to handing off offensive coordinator duties, at least in a titular sense, right? The title of it. Uh, and at least maybe in the game day play calling sense, doesn't mean that the weak strategy leading up the head coach isn't playing a primary role, but the actual execution on game day, eventually almost all of these guys that remain successful do eventually pass on the reins to a young Jedi Padawan, right? Why hasn't Sark done that yet? And I'll give you an example very quickly. Kalen DeBoer, who is credited as sort of the mind behind the Washington offense, he doesn't call plays on game day. That's Ryan Grubb. And Ryan Grubb has been tied to Kalen DeBoer for 12 years. DeBoer actually turned over play calling duties to Grubb back at Fresno State before they even made it over to Washington. Now, is DeBoer heavily involved in the week of game planning? Yes. Is he in in Grubb's ear on, hey, that thing we talked about, this would be a good time to call that. Absolutely. But 
he passed on the reins and is looking at the larger aspects of the program and the, the time that that frees. So when is Sark going to do that? One, is he going to do that? And then two, is, is my claim correct? Because on the offensive side, we can see all these examples of success, of people eventually passing on the reins. We also see failure, which is Jimbo Fisher. And we'll talk about him in a second. But on defense, isn't it true that Gary Patterson had great success at TCU and he effectively remained the D.C. the whole time? So help me reconcile this, this seeming paradox. I think the reason people do make the change, regardless if you're a head coach calling the plays or you have an OC, you make a change when you're on the hot seat. You make a change where you're not having success. So as long as your formula is working, regardless of how you're addressing it, if it's not broke, no one's going to suggest that you fix it. You may not even suggest that you fix it. So as long as Sark continues to have the success on offense, I anticipate we'll be fine with that. Um, but I also want head coaches to do what they feel most confident in, what they feel works for them. Because as soon as you get some ruffled feathers or pettiness and kind of dabbling in the play calling, not fully releasing, like you have to be ready for that as a head coach. So I don't anticipate it until we just see some something that we just don't like. I mean, look at Ryan Day as is making this transition now. Um, there's varying opinions about Bill O'Brien, uh, both at the college level and in, 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 in the NFL. However, Bill O'Brien is coming in as the OC at, at Ohio State. Why is that? Well, <laughs> preservation, <laughs> you know, it's self-preservation. It's like, what move can I make that is both drastic enough and hopefully beneficial enough to show that we're taking steps to improve? That is yep. why these moves are made. Sometimes fear does the work of reason, <clears throat> right? So yeah. if, if you, you could reason your way to, I need to hand over play calling duties eventually, which is what Kalen DeBoer did. He didn't do that mm -hmm. under pressure or duress. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, Drew nailed the psychology of coaches. When you're the head coach who's the head you know, defense coach or the offensive coach, the easiest way to buy time when things start to go badly is either you get a giant contract from Texas A&M <laughs> or you go hire your DC or your OC and you promise everything's going to change and I'm going to step away. And Jimbo is a great guy to discuss because he's the full 360 experience, a national championship winning coach at Florida state running what was at the time an obsolete, overly complex offense. And he won with talent. Let's be frank, <coughs> a great defense, by the way. And then as things start to fall apart, he's given a lifeline. Uh, Drew, basically beautifully described this off, off air. He was given a lifeline by Texas A&M. This is a guy who was going to be on his way out anyway, given this incredible contract. We know what happened. But Jimbo Fisher, to Drew's point, late when, think, when, the, when the dogs start barking, he went and hired Bobby Petrino to be his OC. And was he ever his OC? Ian, what do you think? What, what happened there? Is, is, is Jimbo Fisher the perfect illustration of this full cycle? Probably. Uh, it's funny that he hired the only guy with an offensive system as old as his. Yes. <laughs> he didn't go get Jeff Levy, did he? Somebody pointed out, uh, I saw somebody on Twitter, they were like, you know, Jimbo had this problem where he couldn't give up play calling and that's what doomed him. And I was like, was the problem that he didn't give up play calling or the problem that he was bad at it? You know, like, was yeah. that a formula that couldn't have worked for a &M if maybe he were actually good at designing their offenses and not turning quarterbacks into robots? You know, like every one of his quarterbacks, you'd watch them. And after like a year or two with Jimbo, they looked like like one of those uh, whenever you see like a robot that's trying to throw like a football or shoot a basketball on like uh, social media. It's like Ch -ch -ch. That's, that's what Jimbo's quarterbacks all looked like after like a year or two of working with him. It was unbelievable. You could tell he just had – froze them up with all these different things. Um, I, you know, Ian, on that point, Haynes King, when he was at A&M, yeah. he looked like a dude that had the helmet radio on yes. being coached to throw a football like yes. live. Like first I want you to step back. Then I want you to lift the ball. 
then I want you. <laughs> it's like, and then the guy goes to Georgia Tech, and whatever you think of him, he looked like a he looked like a playmaker. He looked like the guy that we we you know people fell in love with in East Texas. So that's a great point, Ian. Sorry, I had to I had to just expand upon that. Yeah, it was. I noticed it with Kellen Mond, and then like his his successors also looked like that. Uh, and it was like, oh, what in the world is going on there? Um, but uh, I, I think Jimbo is, is a really – I think the underlying principle is that coaches need to be surrounded by people that fill in their weaknesses. Like the leader of any organization is only as good as the people propping them up. And uh, this is like one of, the, it's one of the frustrating things about, say, like the American presidential system is like the most important thing is who these guys pick in their cabinets and you have no idea who it's going to be until you elect them. Um, coaching is not quite that dire because you, you they have to present a, a staff plan when they get hired. Jim Jimbo, I think had a very, very poor sense of what he did well and what he needed help in. And he just did not make higher his, his instinct when everything was going wrong was like, well, I'll just do that myself. Well, I'll just do that too. Um, that's very common. Charlie Strong was like that too. You could tell like that, that the other way other than, Oh, I'm going to hire somebody and I'm going to give them total control. The other one is don't worry. I'm going to take over and fix this. Right. Um, Jimbo was the Jimbo would be like, I'll, I'll hire a defensive coordinator and give them total control. DJ Durkin can run a three down front with our horde of four down defensive linemen that we spent. $20 million or whatever accumulating. That's fine. I'm going to fix things on offense. Um, they, there's just so many things that, that can go wrong in like organizing a staff in a football team that Jimbo really exemplifies. Yeah. If you've ever seen fast times at Ridgemont high, there's a scene where Jeff Spicoli and the football player that uh, the high school flies in just for games right? Jefferson and his little brother, Spicoli and Jefferson's little brother steal the car that Ridgemont boosters bought Jefferson and they wreck it. And Spicoli tells him with confidence, I can fix it. I can fix it. And that's what I always hear in my mind when I look at the Jimbo Fishers of the world who are circling the drain and they're assuring everyone that they can fix it. Uh, interesting thing about Jimbo too, and this is a broader leadership principle, probably not just football. He wanted to be involved in everything and have this complete control. But then after the game, it was all about the players screwing him over. It was all about, because we didn't execute is coach speak for the players effed me. If you say it to excuse every single thing that went wrong. One thing I love about Sark is he'll say, yeah, the play caller blew that whole half. Uh, you know, remember, I don't know if you guys remember Oklahoma state, uh, in 2021, after that that game, Sark, they were asking about, hey, how did it get away from you? What happened? And he said, yeah, I've, I've got a real problem with the play caller in the second half. He needs to get his stuff together. And he was being self-deprecating. But the point was, hey, I let my guys down. Hey, I made a stupid call there. Uh, and coaches, you know, by the way, sometimes the players do F everything up and they need to be called out. But sometimes the coaches do too. And I think the players appreciate not getting all the blame when they know that control was in the coach's grasp the entire week of game prep. And then, you know, after the game, it's all about how the players, you know, blew my incredible game plan that would have worked perfectly. So uh, I, I do think, I, I do think what I've, what I've noticed, and this is what happens. Fans and administrations get so impatient. And so what happens is, and I'm not saying it's unjustified, an unjustified impatience, but what happens or what tends to happen is let's say like James Franklin, Penn State, regardless of the situation, there's only so many times they want to win nine games or 10 games before they're like, okay, what's next? Uh, there's only so many times AM was going to allow Jimbo to come close but not get there. There's only so many so much time we're going to allow Sark to come close but not really get there. Um, I mean – Harbaugh had eight years in Michigan um, and had to take a pay cut along the way, had to, I mean, he had, he had things rotating in and out. Like he has had to endure a ton of resistance just to get this one championship. 
And what I think people don't realize is the margins, even for Harbaugh, the margins, even for Saban, you go back and look at some of these games, people lose. I mean, you can get close and still lose. You can be great and still lose. And so the goal is just to have yourself in the mix every year. And if you're in the mix every year, that doesn't necessarily mean you need a wholesale change at OC or DC or, or just that is what's needed. That's what's happening at Ohio State right now. And I'm not saying they don't need that change, but you can tell that it's like, man, y'all are going all in. Not only are you going all in the portal, uh, which shows how much pressure there is. You're going, oh, see, like you're going. I mean, it took you a week to let your quarterback that started for you all year go. Um, regardless of his shortfalls, like you, I mean, he was out. It, it was like the exit interview is like, you're not going to be the guy next year. And so Ohio State didn't have to take those measure, measures to be in the mix again next year. They have a very solid foundation as a program. So that's the dynamic that's always going to come into play on does this head coach transition? Does Is change needed within the program? It's all based on how much pressure, and it, you just don't know how much of that is true reflection on what we need and how much of that is, you know what, we're sick of just hitting a wall. We're going to throw everything at it to break through. Because just another note on, on Ryan Day, um, I don't think Bob, uh, Bill O'Brien, has won a national championship or wait, hold on. Did he win a national championship with Saban? Okay. He was a receiver injury away. Okay. He, he did not. So, so you're making these drastic changes that are supposed to get you closer and over that threshold. This guy under Nick Saban did not win a national championship. Actually he was heavily criticized for how he performed in those games. And so not every change is necessary, but pressure Optics, sometimes just the optics in and of itself, give people more time. And I think there's a bit more of that influence where people just aren't satisfied with being on the margins of being close. They think all these changes, sometimes massive changes, are going to make the difference. And that's not always the case. I so, think to, on, on day also, I, I bet you anything that the massive investment into retaining all their fringe NFL guys and bringing in big portal people came with the stipulation you got to change up the offense yeah yeah i think that's fair but let's talk about two coaches who played for the national title you mentioned national titles drew right mm -hmm. the two coaches that just played for the national title and coached for the national title both stepped back from play calling mm -hmm. in fact jim harbaugh turned over that offense to the degree that sharon mm -hmm. moore could be the head coach in waiting right he was the head coach and by the way, felt secure enough in his role, not just as an offensive coordinator, but as an interim head coach, that he's going for it on fourth down, fourth and five on the 48-yard line against Penn State repeatedly, right? Kalen DeBoer, we talked about his relationship to Ryan Grubb. Uh, Grubb is the play caller on game day. Certainly DeBoer has input and influence, but he's very established there. So these are two coaches who took less prominent positions uh, Jim Harbaugh, a little bit like Nick Saban, is masterful at going in and fixing something and really getting his sleeves rolled up and fixing some aspect of the program. But he's also very comfortable with stepping back when he's got his guys and he trusts his guys like a Sharon Moore. So my question is, not to be a dog on the bone about this, when does Sark step back from play calling duties? So Should he? I think, I think a little bit on this, we're, we're confusing the symptoms for the illness. Um, the guy who should step back and take more of a managerial role is the guy who wants to do that. The guy who's like, oh, wow, if I can just find someone to do this, then I have so much vision that I could execute in overseeing some defensive vision and quality control on special teams and more time I can spend recruiting, right? The guy that's like, no, no, I do. The guy that does, that's clinging to play calling it, it becoming a manager who steps back requires a load of skills that may be as rare as being an elite play caller. It's not something that you're like, Oh, if you just tell them to step back from play calling, then they'll be so great at managing the program. No, 
managing the program is an entirely different talent that they may or may not possess. Um, that, that, that's the best response to my devil's advocacy there, Ian. I, I agree completely. And the answer for me is I don't know. Um, so, so for sure. Okay, go ahead. Where have we suffered possibly as a program? Sark, the head coach. Where have we suffered as a program potentially? And to Ian's point, if you don't surround yourself with the right people, doesn't Sark need a true coach of the defense, a head coach of the defense? And, and people say, well, that's what a defensive coordinator is. Not really. Not really. So, and I'll give you a quick example. Think strategy and tactics. Okay. Tactics are, how are we going to take that hill? Okay. Strategy is, I'm not sure we need to take that hill. We should probably bypass the hill. In fact, I think the hill is unnecessary. Uh, I don't think it presents any advantage. So the question is, a head coach of the defense says, yeah, we don't need to take that hill. That's a distraction. Here's what we're going to do. And the head coach goes, oh, okay, well, sounds good. Well, sound rubber stamp. The defensive coordinator goes, hey, I'm going to coach the defense this week again, and we're going to try to improve on our stuff. And, you know, uh, they've got one good receiver that well, I'm kind of thinking about maybe we should double team him. Is there a difference there, Drew? Of Does Sark need a Gary Patterson strong personality head coach of the defense or can we get by in our present system because in fairness is our defensive staff a little bit of a hodgepodge from its conception and we're still trying to catch up on some things i, I feel as though from a defensive standpoint let's, let's just say pk is our coordinator slash head coach um that that is the role he is playing currently and yes, it is a hodgepodge. I feel as though we've handled our defensive staff in the way we handle our recruiting is that whoever we pull in from the really even the offensive staff, whoever we pull in to be on our defensive staff, they're going to come into our culture, learn what we do. We're going to take insights and thoughts from what they bring to the table. And we're going to find a way to get better. If there's something that's going to make us better, we're going to do what makes us better. Um, but Sark hired that whole staff on defense and, and he hired them in a hodgepodge. I mean, he hired Blake Gideon one week, he hired Bo Davis another week and we were sitting around figuring out what else he's doing. And then he pulls a head coach and, Je and Jeff Choate pulls him in uh, to be linebacker coach. We went through that process. So I feel because Sark has been intentional about what he was looking for, both from what he wanted in coaches and what he wanted in culture he was able to piece together that staff that they were all going to come in, be selfless, be open to change, be open to how they want to fit into or how they can fit into this, this really into this defensive structure. And I think Sark wants to continue to it's he's he's while he's both learning and growing as a head coach, he is kind of has a proof of concept that he feels comfortable with. It's like, Hey, if I can find the right guy, the right linebacker coach, the right person to come in and fit in, if I can flex guys, if I can find guys who can bring defensive insight um, into that room, that's what they want. That's what they're going to lean on. And so we just had a great defense this year and I don't, I would, and we still have room to grow. I just see, while I see the value of having a head coach, somehow Sark has found a way to balance this hodgepodge and we've still been productive with it while also knowing that we have room for growth. And he is specifically addressing those areas as well. And I think most recently with 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 Willie Gay coming in as an analyst for for the DBs. Let me can I can I go to the rim here? Can I cook at the rim here for a second, Paul? I think. I think this is what's happened uh, in Texas with, with Sark and the defensive staff hires. In the SEC, where Sark has been, the way it works is you fill up your position coaches with recruiters. Because it's in, this, in the SEC, it's all about talent accumulation. And uh, the coaches may or may not be particularly good at coaching technique. But the number one thing is recruit guys and build relationships with them and oversee the culture in that way. PK 
is used to a very collaborative approach in other conferences. Um, I, I've heard Aranda talk about this in regards to the SEC and just how different it is in that regards. Like Aranda's talked about going to LSU and his position coaches were like, he'd like try to talk scheme and strategize with them. And they're like, I don't know, just, just tell us what you want us to do. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, man. Just what do you, you tell us and we'll do that. Just tell us what you want and how to do it and we'll make it happen for you. Um, and he was like, Oh, okay. Um, I think PK is a little more used to that. Maybe not quite to that degree, but more like that. Uh, he was used to collaborating with Jimmy Lake. He was used to collaborating with other coaches at Boise state. Um, when he took over the Boise state defense, I've heard his preference was to teach systems that allowed players to have agency and make decisions on their own on the field. And the SEC is not like that. The SEC is get talent, tell them exactly what to do. And Texas probably in between, right? We Texas has had players where it's like, free that guy up and let him do whatever he wants. And then it, Texas also often has guys where it's like, tell him exactly what to do, right? Give him one, two, three rules and just let him be fast and athletic and, and technically savvy. And um, so I think PK, the collaborator, collaborator came into Texas and didn't find anyone to collaborate with really to some extent. Um, I think that this defense has had the most clear direction when Gary Patterson was providing half or more of the vision from his like shadow coordinator role a year ago. And, uh, I, I'm very curious to see how Sark adjusts here. And it's possible that he already has by bringing in his old buddy, Johnny Nansen, uh, to be co-defensive coordinator. Now, uh, sorry, Choate, Choate did provide a lot of vision on defense as well. Sometimes, I think Choate was great. Sometimes the vision he provided was maybe like some of the stuff that people hated the most, like vision quarters and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But um, yeah, I they need... They need somebody that's – it's possible that PK did himself a disservice by coming to Texas. I know it's worked out pretty well. But Texas maybe needed someone more who was going to come in and be the alpha dog in the room and just tell everybody how it was going to be. And that, PK does not operate that way, which I would have said was a strength up until really this season. And it, it's apparent that it's like not the ideal skill set. So it's, it's very instructive, I think. To, this is all good stuff. So I, I watched – I'm going to try to tie together some disparate thoughts here. But I watched two college defenses of varying abilities, granted, in the bowl season. And the two most sophisticated college defenses that I saw on the back end were Michigan and Arizona. Arizona runs a lot of stuff. And they also run a lot of stuff up front, but I'm, I'm confident in PK up front, uh, generally speaking. But I think the thought and the prevailing wisdom, which I think might be true, was that PK and Jimmy Lake were a very good collaboration at Washington. And that Jimmy Lake may have been titularly, you know, the defensive backs coach or whatever. He was the defensive coordinator of the back end. And PK handled the front and then they tied it all together and they had a collaborative and at times, uh, constructive friction sort of relationship, which you need. Uh, if, if any of you work for organizations where everyone just agrees all the time, you're you're headed for bad things down the road. Uh, you need to have some constructive feedback. You need to be able to find, like, as in a marriage or a good relationship, you need to find a way to argue constructively, right, and not destructively. And I think coaches are like that. You need to have the confidence that it, you can bring up an idea in the coach's room and someone says, that's not going to work because of this. And someone goes, well, look, well, your proposal is not going to work. Here's why. Here's what they're going to do. And the guy goes, okay, that's a good point. How do we fix that, guys? I think that the point Ian brought up is right. That's the collaboration that PK is used to. And Sark hired the defensive staff. That's not PK's staff. He hired Jeff Choate. That's it. And it's instructive that Jeff Choate is now a head coach. Right? Because he had a certain vision I mean, the we were talking, Drew, in our, our live stream about what you love about Frank Ocam is he's a defensive line coach 
who understands the entire defense. Mm -hmm. The reason Drew brought that up is because it's a rarity. Uh, the defensive line coach tends to be focused on the defensive line and it's about technique and getting these guys to play hard. That's like half your job as a defensive line coach, like mm -hmm. getting guys to play really hard. Uh, but a guy like OKM is unique and probably someone you should keep an eye on in, in the future because that skill set, the, the totality of the defense to be able to understand it and how things interplay, how the front actually affects the safety and, and what gap he's got to fill and what he's got, where he's got to keep his eyes for play action. I, I'm just, I think that we might not have that one other guy who's creating that positive friction or just tying up the back end to marry to what Kwiatkowski wants to do on a positional level of right of Ian saying, Hey, if I teach you your position well enough, you'll understand to the adjustment. I don't have to put it on a chalkboard for you. You'll intuitively know as a football player, Oh, these are the rules. Uh, I don't need the coach. Uh, you know, Nick Saban famously hated hurry up offenses, right? Because they short-circuited his ability to tell his DBs what to do right before the snap. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're probably – I think a lot of what Sark has been doing, and I think he acknowledges this, is I think we were trying to – I think we brought in Nansen and we're trying to bring in Akina as a means of addressing that. Is that fair, Drew? Are we on the right track or are we just throwing things out here in the offseason? No, no, no. Sark is intentional, man. Um, when, when you pull, I mean, yes, and, and the stars align for us. The stars have aligned for Sark in a lot of different ways, from, from Mario Cristobal leaving and them opening up the door for us getting some offensive tackles. Like, there's certain changes that have happened that have been fortuitous for us. Arizona going to the Big 12 um, and their coach leaving opened up the door for us to get Nansen. He's a defensive coordinator who's coming in to be a linebacker coach possibly or d-line coach depending on what we what happens there but at the end of the day he's bringing thought leadership into the room there are players there are coaches in that room they've been there three years what they bring to the table it's it should be out we should know what blake gideon and we should know what everyone else brings to the table so having someone else come in completely different perspective uh, success in their own right has the trust of Sark, he immediately can provide that friction, but he also will provide it in an environment where PK is a collaborative, is a collaborative personality. So um, I, I think this is a great move, a fortunate move for Texas. I would have loved to have Akina come with him, but him coming in, he he, he will be that, that, that force for us. And I think it was incredible. I think it was intentional by Sark. For sure. Okay. So to get back to circle back to the beginning, it's it seems like Sark is doing a pretty good job, despite being a play caller and being very involved there, of trying to bring in the right pieces and trying to adjust on defense to provide the similar staff balance there. Um, but it doesn't seem to be going super smoothly just yet. Obviously the Trying to get Rod Wright did not work out very well. And it was a long time before that was even came to a head. So you wonder like what's even next. Um, my, I have a suspicion that Nansen is going to become the lead co-defensive coordinator because Sark knows him and trusts him from years back. Mm -hmm. And then Nansen is going to end up providing a lot of the suggestions like I'll do defensive line and hire this guy a linebacker. Or I know this defensive line coach, trust me, he'll do great. The problem that you illustrated earlier, Paul, is that Texas doesn't necessarily need that. They need that on the back end. And that's what Akina, that's what I think all three of us thought Akina might solve. And I don't know much about Willie Gay other than that I've watched him actually play live at Heinz Field. I don't know if he's going to provide that sort of input on the back. And I just don't know what, I don't know what things are going to look like. I don't know if that underlying problem gets solved or the extent to which Sark thinks it's a problem. I'll say this. I, I, I know a little NFL 
And I know one of the things that characterizes the, the parallel, almost mirror organizations of the Steelers and the Ravens is they're very good at getting guys on the back end who are extremely tough, like tough minded and tough physically, and also really high football IQ. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't know what Ed Reed would score on the SAT. I know in terms of football IQ, That's he would run circles around me like I'm a child. Yeah. And his recognition is not just on the whiteboard. It's intuitive. It's like he knows it so well, he knows it before it's happening. And if you've ever seen Bill Belichick talk about Ed Reed, it's like the way a boy talks about his first crush. It's like <laughs> it's like so much admiration. Uh, and so I think the Steelers are very similar in that respect. I would be shocked if William Gay is not a very high level football mind. Well, I think he, I, I actually think that's what he could bring. But from a different perspective, these guys all want to play in the NFL one day. And you can either learn to take ownership of your coaching and of your understanding of offenses and of where you're supposed to be on the field now, like Jade Barron has, has proven to do. And as he's been his reputation is a student. It is someone who's obsessed with, pre with preparation and getting into the details. You can start that now and build that reputation now, or you can wait till you get to the NFL and maybe you're playing catch up against other guys who they've already come in with that. And so there's a certain level of professionalism that I'm hoping he can come make everyone aware. It's like, hey, if you want to do this at the next level, the time is now to be obsessed, to work on your technique, to understand the defense, to be flexible. We shouldn't have to hold back this playbook to accommodate you and your limitations or you and your lack of commitment to studying, your lack of commitment to spending the time with your teammates, making sure that you're all on the same accord. Let's stop holding ourselves back. Let's all lean in a little bit more and make sure we show up professional, we show up ready to perform, we show up understanding the ins and outs so that we can be more instinctive play more intuitively and, and understand various parts of our defense so that we can succeed. Because as you stated, um, the, the, the Michigan defense, the Arizona defenses, you knew they were on a string. They were dialed in. And that takes more work than I think most places are, are putting on their staffs, but also on their players currently. And so hopefully Willie Gay can, can impart that wisdom on them. If you watch that Arizona Oklahoma bowl game, Oklahoma moved up and down the field on them. But you could tell there was an intentionality to Arizona's game plan, which is they have superior athletes, but they're starting an inexperienced quarterback. And we're going to win this game by turning him over multiple times. And we're going to play coverages and we're going to run schemes to create turnovers. And if they get a 40 yard gain, I don't care. We'll line up and do it again because over the accumulation of snaps over the course of the game, we're going to start manufacturing these turnover stops. We're going to start getting field position. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and as Drew said, it was on a string like this. Sometimes we tend to attribute what happens to a plan, <laughs> not just on a football field, but in our lives. And you realize a lot of it was not a plan. It just kind of what happened. And then you you constructed it. Like I made that happen, right? <laughs> Arizona made that happen. You could tell what they were trying to do to poor Jackson Arnold, right? Uh, Michigan, similar deal, higher level athletes. But one thing that, I, that struck me, Drew, and I want to pull on you, not just as the analyst, but as the former player to see if this is truthful. Both Michigan and the Baltimore Ravens have a standard in their secondary. And one of them is obnoxious communication. And what they mean is you are going to over communicate to the point where your teammates are irritated. Like, shut up, Drew. I know. Like, I, I got. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him go in motion, guy. Like, you don't have to yell at me. But the point of it is it's one thing to know your job. It's another thing to know your job so well that you know all the other dudes' jobs and you're communicating and yelling out to them because you're confident enough that what you're saying is correct. Uh, example, if, if you're more of a layperson fan, you ever notice the defensive lines lined up and then right before the snap, Jalen Ford runs up and whacks a defensive lineman on his ass 
and says, get in that gap. That's a confident linebacker who knows the larger scheme. Jalen Ford did not do that when he was a freshman. Because even if he thought the defensive lineman was in the wrong gap, he wasn't totally sure. And he didn't want to get like embarrass himself by like, but the obnoxious over communication standard says, not only do you know your job so well, you know, everyone else's job and you're telling them what to do while they're telling you what to do. Drew riff. Dude, I'm telling you, it's funny. Cause I think was it Ray Lewis, maybe a couple weeks ago was, was watching an NFL game. And he almost, he looked disgusted because he was reviewing a play and was like, wait, these guys aren't communicating. They're not talking out there. You're supposed to be talking to your brothers. Like, you're not talking. They didn't say a word. Nobody's pointing. Like, he went, he flipped it because it's true. That's a killer Ray Lewis invitation. Could you do the rest of the, could you do the, rest of the show in that voice, please? The point of communication is, yes, you're on a string, but it holds everybody accountable during the week. Yeah. When someone's account uh, communicating, hey, look out for this and look out for that, you're usually telling someone because they already should know to look out for it or they were studying. It's like, oh, yeah, you saw this. This running back was lined up over the tackle as opposed to being over the guard. That slight difference tipped off the fact that he may exit the backfield as opposed to coming across the, the, the formation. Little things that you pick up on film can be communicated and someone may have a separate viewpoint than you do from the angle you have maybe on the other side of the formation. And so communication is key on that, especially when you're all dialed into preparation. But it's also what it does for an offense. Offensively, if you think you're the ones in control making all of the checks, <laughs> but now as you're checking, they're checking, they're chattering they seem like they're dialed into what you're about to do. You don't know whether to snap the ball or look to the sideline, but whatever you're calling, they're, they're on it. So it can breed some sense of insecurity on the offensive side of things, which I think goes a long way. And once you kind of see the momentum and the impact of what your checks on defense can do to an offense in their preparation, when the quarterback's eyes get wide and he's looking both ways, because just like a pitcher in baseball, whether it's a run play, a pass play, a screen, a quarterback has to come up to the line and almost look identical almost on every play so that he doesn't lose cadence or he doesn't tip off that he's confused. You'll notice it in the NFL. They come to the line of scrimmage, boom, 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 okay? They got to stick with their cadence even if guys keep moving because you can't give a sign of, of confusion or unpreparedness. That communication helps make that happen. It helps actually confuse them, even when they may have to show that they're not confused. So it should be relentless. And Michigan definitely had that on that side of the ball, but it's a part of the Ravens culture. And it has been for years. Yeah. So, all right, here's where I test, I test drive my, my grand pet theory, which may be completely wrong. And I think it's counterintuitive, but I think it may be true. So you guys, you guys be my litmus and my sanity test here. I think during game week, a regular game week prep, I think the defensive coaches have more to do and a harder prep than the offensive coaches. Conversely, in the offseason, I think the offensive coaches have a much harder install uh, creation of, of, of play familiarity and, you know, all that stuff uh, versus the defensive coaches who are more like putting in scheme alignment soundness, and then trying to develop the position. Is this, does this theory hold? Cause I think the average person thinks the offensive game plan is the hardest requires the most wizardry. I think the defensive coaches have the harder road to hoe during a typical game week. I, I agree with with that on a game week standpoint, because I do think the offense, the, the defensive side of things does. You still need to do your full install and any extras in the offseason and get competent with that. However, on defense, you won't use all of that on a week to week basis. You usually like to drill down based on who you're playing. OK, this is what we're going to be great at. Let's make sure we brush up on this. So during the week, the season, you may have 
a, 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 a defense that maybe you haven't repped since, you know, fall. Uh, you maybe did it heavy in the spring. You may have not have repped since fall camp. But now you have to be an expert in this specific coverage because it may be the most consistent way that you're able to sometimes even not tip your hand and not have a tendency going into the game. And so that is the hard part is getting guys up to speed on some things that may shift throughout the week. And when you have mature players, when you have guys who are really dialed in and obsessed, it's less complex. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's very tough on defense, the defensive coordinators throughout the season. And guys like Steve Sarkeesian are the reason why. Uh, you yes. don't know what you're going to get. There's so many different formations. Um, there's personnel changes. There's personnel manipulation. Um, there's so many nuances that go into it. And every team does something different. There's motions in so many different ways now. Uh, you have pistol formations that now you don't even need to, you know, usually if a back was offset to one side or the other, um, you kind of could predict, okay, if the run play is going to go, it's going to go this way. Or if it's going to be a zone read, it's going to be this. It's not that way right now. So it's incredibly tough for defensive coordinators. Uh, but yeah, offensively, once you get installed, everything else is just like, oh, we can attack this three different ways with these different plays. Let's just pick a few. We're going to go with this week. So I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, it's a, I, th I think offense is, to your point, Paul, it's like offense gets to decide where to go. So it's like this week we're going to go here and here. And defense is wait around until the moment of and then try to figure out where they're going. So it is very much, to your point, a long-term plan versus a very short-term decision-making Yeah, I, mean, we, I kind of alluded to the strategy and tactics idea. I think offense, the reason the off-season install is harder is because it's a lot of it's strategic. And then I think a lot of defense week to week is tactical. Like, hey, this wide receiver they've got is, is a son of a gun. We can't just run our stuff on this guy. He's going to have 200 yards receiving. So how can we double team him within our – existing defense and not just create some junk defense on Wednesday that's going to confuse everybody and we're going to blow three coverages. So anyway, we asked and raised a lot of questions. I don't know. We also had some answers. I don't know if they're the definitive answers, but the beauty of this show, the beauty of this off season is we're not just trying to throw out information, which we hope we provide, but also we're trying to raise some questions because we don't know all the answers either. And if you do have some answers, folks, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. We'd love to hear from you at Inside Texas. And most of all, we ask you to do this. You are our marketing department, and we need you to be our evangelists. If you love this content, if you want more of it, you need to link, you need to like, you need to subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel, and you need to tell others. You need to evangelize. Uh, you know other people that are football lunatics in your life. Send them a link, and I think they're going to like this show. I think they're going to, we're going to try to bring you a great offseason uh, with Drew and Ian to talk to. I don't think we can do anything but provide you good stuff. So, gentlemen, I want to say thanks for a provocative and interesting hour. I think we could have done this for two more. I learned stuff. I hope everyone else learned some stuff. And uh, with that, welcome. <laughs>